All right, good evening, good afternoon. We're going to go ahead and get started. I'm Terry Manolio. Um, I'm part of the Center for Precision Health Research and am delighted to welcome all of you uh, and Kate Nathanson to, uh, uh, to our, our July seminar. Um, Kate is the Pearl Basser Professor of BRCA-related research and Deputy Director of the Abrahams, uh, Abrahamson, sorry, Cancer Center, uh, and she leads the Penn, uh, Penn Chart Genomics Initiative, which is how I got to know her because I do genomic medicine uh, primarily uh, at the University of Penn, Pennsylvania. As, as uh, said in the in the notices that went out here, it's a it's a multidisciplinary. A collaborative um, effort that aims to, to optimize use of the electronic health record, no small feat, um, for genomic medicine, including integrating genomic information and making it computable so you can then use it and, uh, for clinical care. Um, so it's developed a, uh, an excellent infrastructure that I would love to see transported here um, into, uh, into the clinical center, and someday we will hopefully do that. Um, so Kate, with no further ado, uh, please go yeah. ahead. Sure. Okay. Thank you. Um, uh, so I'm delighted to be here. I want to thank Terry for inviting me. I've had a wonderful time and a wonderful afternoon. Um, I, I want to. I'm talking about something that was sort of a side so, sidebar um, excursion for me, and then has really um, evolved into a major uh, line uh, involved with clinical care and research. So. Um, I started this, um, you'll see, it's about five years ago in 2019, and when I started to work on optimizing the EHR for genetics, um, my boss, who many of you know, said to me, why are you doing this? And I said, because I think it's better for patient care. And he said, no, no, why are you doing this? And I said, because I think it's better for patient care. And then finally he asked me a third time, and I said, well, I do have a grant that's sort of related to, oh, okay. OK. Um, but really, I got into this because I'm a geneticist. Uh, that's what I do. That's what I do. Uh, that's where I come from. That's my land. And I really wanted to be able to provide the best care for my patients um, in terms of genetics. So I'm going to talk about sort of three topics today. One is the Penn Chart Genomics Initiative. Um, Terry asked me to talk about this. And I apologize if some of you have seen parts of this talk before about what we've done at Penn Medicine in terms of integrating genomic medicine into electronic health record. And then I'm going to talk about two implementation science studies that we have. Uh, one is funded by um, NHGRI, um, uh, which uh, I'm going to talk about the setup for it. We have some data, but it's a little early. Um, and then a second study that's part of one of the implementation science P50s that the NCI is funding, um, also looking at how we do implementation science to um, uh, further uh, genomic medicine. And finally, um, I recently became the head of a new center at Penn called the Penn Medicine Center for Genomic Medicine. And I have to say, um, delving into what the real world is doing in terms of genetic testing has been really a fascinating experience. Um, and even as someone who practices there, uh, I was surprised at what we found when we went looking into it. So I thought I would share to you some of that experience. So this, um, and again, I'm going to have very few intro slides because I really feel like, you know, this is something that's familiar to all of you. Really, the landscape of genomic medicine is really rapidly evolving. I think we can't underestimate the amount that genetic and genomic data permeate every aspect of healthcare. Um, I'm a cancer geneticist, and I remember when people started doing genetic testing, um, somatic genetics of tumors. I remember when we started doing genetic testing for cancer. Um, but I think that the adoption and evolution of this has really changed dramatically. Um, and certainly how testing influences medical management with surveillance and treatment has also really changed dramatically, with many geneticists moving to do more therapeutic interventions. Um, and along with that, um, pharmacogenetics has also expanded. Um, we have a very active pharmacogenetics program that's led by Sony Tutasia. I'm not going to talk about that so much. Um, I'll show one or two examples, but um, I think that is another area. Um, along with that, we really see an evolving legal, ethical, and insurance landscape around genetics. Um, we've worked very closely with our data security and our uh, head of uh, security lawyer at Penn. Um, and really have a lot of discussions continually about how we keep our genomics data secure, how we keep our, um, how we keep our patient data secure, and how we think about that. 
Um, I think what we observe, and I, I really want to emphasize this more than I, I had personally realized, is how much genetics testing is really uh, happening not only outside our traditional model, but outside the genetics program. Um, there was a paper about two years ago in genetics medicine saying, from the hints, saying 20% of individuals report some sort of genetic testing that was really 23andMe, Ancestry, but followed by cancer genetic testing. I would suggest that, um, having done random chart reviews, that that is not an undue number, and it's uh, really happening with genetic testing. Um, but there's, uh, along with that, there's inappropriate test selection, ordering, and really a lack of training in terms of test interpretation uh, for pro providers. And how are we sort of dealing with that as a profession, I think, is a really complicated issue. Um, this is a really nice review that was um, in the American Journal of Medical Genetics um, that really talked about, like, what was genetic testing today? And I really think this is sort of some of the things that we all think about. How do we identify the right patients? How do we order the right tests? Um, how do the tests get performed? How do the results get delivered? And then billing, all of which are happening in a disjointed fashion. Um, I think that, um, in a really sort of complicated fashion, that um, we sort of have to deal with on a routine basis, things around billing, uh, things around um, laboratory testing, all of these kinds of things are complicated. What we want to get to is sort of a very integrated system where you have um, uh, identification of patients who are at high risk of genetic diseases. Um, you want to have the right test selected. You want to do the ordering correctly. And you want the results to come back. And you want them to drive decision support. Um, I think that's been something that we all hopefully can agree on is the principle. And this is the principle on which we really have looked to for the Penn Chart Genomics Initiative. So why do we need to do this? It's important, and I think one of the things that we had to deal with a lot before this change is that genetic results don't change, but uh, you have 10 years of CBCs and they get lost, and we were constantly having providers call us and ask us how to find the genetic testing results all the time. Um, I think that the other thing is that it's really important if we're going to make sure that everybody gets genetic testing or everyone gets care properly, that we decrease our barriers. Um, we really want all of our patients to uh, benefit from advances in genomic medicine, and this is another important thing. Um, and then uh, optimizing clinical decision support, um, you can only do that if you have discrete genetic testing results. I will also say I'm gonna, that, um, and I think in the end, you need to present these results so they're easily accessible and easily understandable. That's really sort of the bottom line principle here. I'm also gonna say that I uh, feel very strongly um, and I'm a very opinionated person, so you know I'm just take, you can take that with a grain of salt. Um, but um, that we should be changing the EHR. We shouldn't be building things outside the EHR that are you know sort of blocking into the EHR. We should be changing our electronic health record. We have worked very closely with Epic Central. In fact, I'm missing today my monthly meeting with Epic Central and their genetics team to really try to think about how to do this so that the entire system. So when we try things at Penn and we advance them, they go across the country and they're really disseminated nationally. Um, I really feel very strongly that sort of somehow, um, and I'm not saying they're not bad, but I think it's important to think about changing the system, not doing more one-off things. Um, so how do you do this? So um, one of the things that was really important for us is we really had to have support across the health system. Um, and we really were lucky that our um, IS team, our information systems team, uh, really bought into this right away. Um, our uh, chief, um, one of our, uh, actually our chief medical officer for Penn Medicine Medical Group is actually also a geneticist. She's a reproductive geneticist. And so she obviously has been very supportive of this and really feels this is essential. Um, it's kind of interesting. I think we're probably the only health system where the chief medical officer or the head is a geneticist and the deputy director of the cancer center is also a geneticist. So, you know, unusual in that sense and so a lot of support. We really um, uh, have a multidisciplinary clinical team that's worked on this um, for molecular pathology, pharmacogenetics, really our information system and we worked incredibly closely and really well supported by our information system and clinical research. Um, I have to say that one of the things that we found that really worked, I didn't realize this was going to happen, is that we were able to get awards uh, for this work. 
you know, the and the information system group was all over this. So um, they like put in for all of these awards, so they could point to all these awards. They're um, presenting it. Oh, it's UGM, not UG. Uh, but anyway, the EPIC uh, users um, groups, and so they but were really in, in, in interested in doing this, worked very closely with our legal team, and then you have to partner with commercial testing labs. So the testing labs that we have integrated, um, we could have a long discussion, I don't know how many of you guys are familiar with Aura, which is the um, next thing that EPIC is doing for integration, are actually not on Aura, so just to, to say that. Um, and it, as I said, institutional support's really, really intentional. And so the other thing is the first thing we had to do that we did actually many years prior was we standardized our naming conventions. So the problem is that if you call something different, everything different in the EHR, it's really hard to find. You can't do it. But we actually have a, a genetics group uh, for all of our genetics group, neurogenetics, cardiogenetics, reproductive genetics. And we agreed as a group to standardize our naming convention. Um, and then we created actually a tab in our uh, in pen chart, which is called the Precision Medicine tab. We intentionally did not call it the Genetics tab because we felt that was going to be important to put other data. Um, we have an immune health initiative. Their data goes there. Um, and so we also have a specific document type. So if you scan in that document type, it's a genetics document type, it automatically goes in there. Um, we actually now have moved our somatic genetics into that, um, and also that's coming through as discrete data. I'm not talking about the somatic genetics efforts today, but that's part of that. We also, because of the legacy uh, of naming everything the same, we're able to actually move the data into the tab uh, as best we could. I'm not going to say perfectly because we had that name. And this is actually old data, but just sort of says it's very well used tab. People know it's there, and they're looking for their genetics tab. So this is. <coughs> Five years, I realized, when I was putting this together. So the overnight success story that took five years. So um, we have a joke at Penn because CAR T is the overnight success story that took 10 years. Um, so uh, I, um, uh, we started this in 2019. It was a shock to me to realize this has been five years. Um, and we started to work on doing this. And this is just sort of a timeline. This is actually maintained by our um, IS colleagues and said, you know, we started it. We kicked it off on 9-11, 2019. Uh, we started to put in the genomics module. We, when we put in the genomics module, you had to pay extra. Now you don't have to pay extra for it. Um, and we started to do this sort of step by step, adding in, um, you start with PDFs, then you add in discrete data. But you have to do this. And I think part of the reason I'm showing this is to tell people that it's not like something that you can instantaneously do. Like it takes a lot of time and energy and really a long period of time to be able to do this for what we did, HL7. With the Aura integrations, it's shorter time. But as I said, many of these labs are not on Aura, which we could talk about. Um, so just to sort of think about it. So the way it works here, and um, I don't know if I can do this. Can people see this online? I can't tell. No. Um, I'm just trying to see. I have a thing. So um, our tab is the Precision Medicine tab. So what happens is that you have your results document. It can be either scanned or come in through HL7. Um, and then you have your discrete data, which is in the also attached. So your discrete data, I'll show you pictures. The discrete data is up. And, it come, and it's attached to a scan document. So that's the full genetic testing report. Um, it comes in through external genetic testing lab. That you can have both come in, which is the PDF plus the structured data. Uh, when we do this, the cadence always is to do the PDF first and then the structured data second. That's the integration. And then you have the HL7 interface or manual entry. Then we have something uh, goes through an epic thing called the uh, genomics translational engine. Um, so for pathogenic, likely pathogenic, and gene, also not mosaicism. Um, we'll talk about genomic indicators. Um, and then this is actually where you also get CPIC translational tables. Um, you have a patient chart and a snapshot page. And then it goes to both provide patient facing information and clinical decision support. I'll talk about this in more detail. So just to show you, um, for those of you who don't look at EPIC or look at this, this is what the, it looks like. One of the things that we spent a lot of time um, being adamant and being pissy about was making sure that everything was in HGVS. Um, there are some labs that don't use HGVS, believe it or not, to this day. Um, and we have been refusing to integrate with labs that are not standardly using HGVS, actually. 
Um, I and actually that has taken hold, and there's an epic Jones Brain Trust, and that is something that they are really pushing very strongly. We will not. They are. Epic is actually now requiring all the labs to use HGBS, um, and that was something that we were really uh, very adamant about. Um, this is just the um, significance. This is actually a patient of mine, um, even though it's anonymized. Um, and then you can see the position, the build, all of these kinds of things that are coming in. Um, and also main transcripts, another thing that's really important here. And then this is what it looks like. Um, this is a genomics indicator. You'll, I'll talk more about this. But this is on the front page, and so then you know a patient has something. I thought for you guys, since I don't know how many of you look at Epic, I think it's, a, you know, how does it look like uh, for providers? So we actually, you can set it up so that this is, these are older screenshots, uh, so some of the indications have changed. But the point is that you have um, things uh, that you set up, um, and then you can do, uh, pick your genes. This is a custom panel. You can pick genes. Um, you can actually have uh, what you can say uh, down here. Um, is that, you know, do you want the kit actually sent out to the patient? This was actually something that physicians requested. So you can actually have the kit sent to the patient if you click, and that will go through. Um, I think the other thing that's not here but that has become really important to us now is the 21st Century Cures Act. Um, do you want manual release or do you want auto release? And that we took off as a default. So when you do genetic testing ordering, you have to specifically ask whether you want manual or um, Auto release, and if you have manual release, you have to have agreed with the patient document. This is a 21st century cures. And this is on the right, this is an aortopathy panel, um, a different lab, and just sort of giving some of the questions. The only ones that are required are the ones with the uh, red exclamation points. This is what it looks like when it comes back to us. I showed you another example. This is the, pat this is the patched one example just seen. Um, you can actually see below that the scanned result is actually linked below here. You can't see that, but also it, uh, this is can you release the com comments. And also below here, it also says, uh, do you want to have a genomic indicator turn on? So this is, uh, people always ask, what does an, a VUS look like? It doesn't have the red exclamation point. The red exclamation point, by the way, is for any abnormal lab in EPIC. So if your sodium is wrong or anything is wrong, it's a red exclamation point. So that's not unusual. This is a flags when you have VUSs. So it's important to think about what the EPIC genomics module is and isn't. Um, so the EPIC genomics module, I like to think about it as an Excel spreadsheet. It's a place where you put your data. It's not something that helps you order. It's not something that helps you result. It's a place to have data. And I found a lot of people really getting confused because they think, oh, you have the module, so now you can order and do what we do. That's not it. The data is just a place for data storage. And you have to set up the ordering, and you have to set up the resulting. It doesn't enable anything else. This actually, by the way, is not the way it looks now. It's what's coming in Epic, but they didn't want me to show the old one, so I have to show what's coming rather than the new, the new what's really there, but that's all another issue. Um, so this has been quite successful. <coughs> this is actually up here. So this is um, really the integrate, really increased, and as you can see over time, the real increase in the use, um, and we have uh, over 385 genetic uh, ordering providers, you know, uh, you know, spoiler alert, they're not all geneticists. Um, uh, and then over 12,000 orders have been placed or resulted as part of clinical care. So this has really taken off. It's really well used. But I, I want you to observe one of the things that I think is important is the difference between ordered and resulted. And we thought um, there were some reasons for that. Um, why is there a difference between being ordered and resulted? We thought. Uh, we had an old place where we were storing the results. Was it because where we were storing the results and it was not getting ordered? Um, we actually now have a better sense of why that is. I'll talk about that at the end. Um, but I think that's important to, to know. So the other thing is that we found is that people, we built it, they wanted improvements. So one of the things that we did is that um, the insurance information is now sent directly to the testing company. Um, all of that is really automated so that um, insurance does uh, the VUS. And we've seen this now. We've been doing this long enough. The variants of uncertain sequence updates actually go back to the patient chart and the provider inbox. So there's no worry that you're missing them. Um, you can send the testing kits out. Uh, one of the things that I, I'm not going to talk about so much, but I think I'll highlight a little later on, 
is that you can find patients with mutations in specific genes using slicer or dicer. Um, they are now building it so you can do variants. We asked them to do that, and they're doing that for EPIC. And so your EHR becomes a database that you can use to identify your patients with genetic variants. Um, and that's a really important use and really, you know, s helps you for research and for other causes. I'm going to have a specific example later. Um, and also the clinical test from the visit can be sent straight. This is uh, in EPIC straight to the testing company to support your insurance claims. So that's actually also very helpful. So does it save time? Um, this was not something, this was actually an idea of actually one of our fellows was, uh, let's do a time uh, study to see if this is helpful. And actually, uh, what we found was it was surprisingly, this is uh, integrated versus not integrated, so using a lab-specific portal versus the EHR. And if you do sort of three tests um, ordered and three tests resulted, not unusual for a genetic counselor, that saves 36 minutes a day. So people can really operate at total uh, top of scope. So having the integration really makes a difference in terms of people's uh, performance. So really your goal really here is the, uh, you know, in the end, you want to have the data there. You want to have it right there so everybody can tell when you have a genomic indicator. I had someone call me from uh, another institution locally and said, how do you let people know that people have a mutation? And I said, well, a genomic indicators. And they said, what are genomic indicators? They had someone sue because they didn't know that someone had a mutation. And so I said, well, there's actually a way to do this. Um, and so they come, the variants uh, drive it. They drive the clinical decision support. Um, and this is the, what the patients see. So there's um, actually, this is our Penn Medicine. It's changed, but this is a test, old test patient. So you have this that's right there. So this has really changed our charts. And I, I want to sort of say it does need constant maintenance. And I realize these numbers are super, super small. But what you don't see is that the, for BRSA 1 and 2, we've been really um, careful and we've really um, gotten all of our patients. So there are 1,500 BRSA 2 mutation carriers and 1,100 BRSA 1 mutation carriers. I don't know if you can see the numbers. And over 600 Lynch syndrome patients that now have genomic indicators. So recently someone asked, are oh, lung cancer increased in BRSA 1 and 2 mutation carriers? Boom de boom, we pulled them all out with their genomic indicators, and we can do those studies right away because we have the EHR data, just like all of us, and we can pull those data out. And this is really something that we're really pushing. You can, as soon as the data comes in, you do it. And then when people have specific interests in specific diseases, you'll see, for example, we have a big Lynch syndrome program. They're all indicated with um, genomic indicators. And so this is really important. We have 139. We should have. Most of them are disease. We have um, over 10,000 active indicators um, and quite a few shared varying. It does need maintenance, and this is very important, but this is really now people are really thinking about using this because it becomes a database for them. It's really, um, and so we have now clinical decision support. This is um, for actually Lynch genome and BRSA 1 and 2. It actually took a lot of optimization, um, but uh, we have uh, ways this, I'll show how it shows, but this is how it shows for the patients. It's in the health maintenance tab. Um, you know, is you need your gyno appointment? Do you have your MRI? Do you have your mammogram? Has to be very dependent on, for example, you can't, can't tell people they need an MRI if they've had a mastectomy. So you have to uh, build in algorithms for this. It's particularly important to be able to do. Um, and so this is what it looks like to the patient. Um, I don't know if you've seen, this is your preventative care. This is your Lynch syndrome. You can pull out your patients that are late. You can send them bulk messages saying you're late. You need to have what's happening. You need to do it. Um, it requires a lot of review and iteration because surgeries particularly are not coded well, so you're not uh, automatically picked up. And so we've had to uh, do some a lot of optimization. Um, and this is actually showing, this is a paper that ju we just published actually um, actually, it's 2024, uh, just came out this week on uh, clinical optimization for, um, I think this is, uh, for optimization for Lynch syndrome, building this for Lynch syndrome. Um, this is clinical decision support um, for pharmacogenetics, which we have also built for pharmacogenetics variants, also BPAs, also sitting in uh, the precision medicine tab. Um, there are mostly sort of a warning, uh, but for serious potential adverse events, you can have BPAs. Um, that come up with an interruptive warning to say, please don't order this drug. 
So what are the challenges? This has been, you know, we started small, which I think we did. The technical build, we established stains. Um, there's some language barriers, yes. Um, and the vendors, uh, very different. Some vendors are great, some not so great. Uh, really sort of uh, concerns about privacy that we had to deal with and make sure that we were on board. Um, it, the timing was done, um, sort of different um, genetics programs actually are more or less on board, which has been, in, was interesting. Um, and there was impact on clinical workflows and knowledge dissemination. This actually was really surprising to us. Uh, we sort of built this, there was a lot of demand for dissemination and a lot of interest in this. Um, so we, with the support actually of a supplement to a grant from NCI, uh, we built a website. This has actually been up, this constantly, we update it every time we do this. Um, it has uh, uh, videos explaining what we've done. It has uh, links to be able to replicate and to be able to build this. Um, and we've also linked it to actually a provider information website that we developed as part of our NHGRI funded grant, uh, which is um, uh, uh, also um, linked in there. So people have all of those and they're freely available. So um, I think it's really important to change your EHR to meet the needs of genomic medicine. Uh, you need a multidisciplinary group. Um, we've demonstrated this is really highly utilized. Um, there are some limitations um, in what information can be provided, um, but one of the things I'm going to talk about that we've really leveraged actually uh, for the next projects for some of our um, science is uh, one-click genetic testing essentially and insurance-sensitive testing. So you're capitated to a provider, your testing goes to the right lab that's connected. That's really important. Um, clinical decision support is complicated. It really needs some reiteration and supervision, and you have to do this. Um, uh, so you can move now from HL7 to Aura, which is actually uses Care Everywhere functionality. There are only some labs, um, and they're only actually it's they have to pay Epic a huge amount of money, so they have to be pretty wealthy companies to do it, which has been an interesting thing. Um, and we really feel very strongly about sharing our resources and tools, but it's important to recollect that each um, institutional EHR is different. So um, this is talking about implementation science, um, research that we we'll have ongoing in genomic medicine, um, which leverages our EHR. So um, Penn is a big um, um, believer in behavioral economics. I think this comes from our really affiliation with the Wharton School. Um, so the idea is you identify what are the barriers to the use. Um, so we identify what are the system barriers, what are the clinical barriers, and what are the patient barriers. So you want to try and address each of these barriers when you're uh, uh, addressing sort of uh, bringing forward genetic testing. So for example, what are systematic barriers, identifying patients, adequate workforce, um, clinician barriers are what test do I order? That's actually uh, common. How do I interpret the results? Um, are there costs, how the patient feels, um, what is the patient, do they know they should get checks, what is the endorsement, and what is the lack of awareness. Um, so we use behavioral economics to increase the evidence of uh, 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 based interventions. There's a lot of, uh, I think, the 17 years between evidence and moving into clinical care. And so behavioral economics is a tool to be able to reduce that gap time. Um, and so why is it helpful? So it's helpful because patient people are busy, um, you know, it's complex. We really need to use systems to make optimal decisions, and we mentally use shortcuts. Um, this has been used extremely successfully at Penn for all sorts of different things, flu vaccines, um, statin optimization, opioid use, um, and so all sorts of uh, tools are built in the EHR to sort of facilitate the right decision. Um, and so you want to use behavioral economics and nudges to facilitate this optimal decision making. So behavioral economics targets situations where choices um, don't, are making choices that aren't optimal. And we use nudges. We have a nudge unit, actually, um, which changes the way choices are presented to make sure it guides or motivates what we would consider the correct or optimal decision making. And they're low, low scalable, implemented in the EMR, and they're sustainable. That's the whole point. Once we build what we've built, it keeps going. No, they're not. We have funding. We couple the nudge building with electronic phenotyping. So the idea is that you identify, and I'm sure you guys are as familiar as I am with electronic phenotyping, you electronic health records, you use phenotyping approaches and do validation through chart review. Um, and so I'm gonna talk about these two projects. I didn't name them. Um, so 
One, the first one is using behavioral economics and implementation science to advance the use of genomic medicine utilizing a EHR infrastructure across a diverse health system. And the second is sequential electronic health record-based strategies to increase genetic testing for breast and ovarian cancer risk around diverse patient populations and gynecological practices. Someone is much better at long, complicated names than I am. Um, anyway, so this is our advancing genomic medicine. As I said, I'm going to present the structure. This is really done. This is words I never thought I would say, six-arm pragmatic cluster randomized clinical trial, um, where we randomize this way. So we have um, eligible clinicians identified um, and they are clustered in three different ways. No nudge, nudge to refer, nudge to order. And then we have physician uh, patients who will get a nudge or no nudge. So that ends up with six arms. No nudge, nudge to a patient only, nudge to a clinician only for refer, nudge to a clinician and a patient, refer, nudge to a clinician only order, and then nudge uh, a patient. So cluster randomization means that if you get people who work together like a um, advanced care provider, who works with the physicians, you cluster them together. This is all across all the Penn Medicine hospitals. This is actually more, because you'll see the numbers are actually much uh, more than 2,000 patients, over 300 physicians. This is 100% EMR. Uh, our paper was just accepted uh, describing this, um, actually, um, uh, in implementation science for the protocol paper was just is about to come out. So um, when we think about nudges, what do we um, do? We uh, Target. So we have uh, four targets. Uh, so status quo. So the, is the you, you stick with the current approach, even there's a new and better one. Omission, focusing on the potential harm of action more than unaction, inaction, and then focusing effect, short-term challenges versus long-term gains, and then impact, uh, overestimating the adverse impact. And you can see um, some of the language that you can use to do this. I'll take a drink while people read. So um, what we did to evaluate these different options is that we actually did something, I'm sure you've heard of a direct choice experiment. So we worked with providers. We sent them a red cap survey, and we asked them to select between, and this is an example of the red cap survey, which message would be most or least likely to get you to do genetic testing to determine the treatment. So this is most or least likely, and they checked this. So you actually go through an iterative set of experiments. Um, and then this is a focus group um, to identify. Uh, we sat down with patients and said which, which of these messages would be much more responsive to you. So for the clinicians, actually, very interesting, very significantly picked the status quo bias. So status quo, I'll, I'll go back a few slides, is your patient has been identifying a candidate in the past. It may not have been important, but now it guides treatment decisions. I have to say it was really interesting. Um, we got a lot of really interesting comments on it where they were like, "We, I would hate you if you sent me something with this language. This is the one they really liked, the omission. Like they, they were like, it was very strong. Then the patients, we went back and forth with they want text messaging, um, and they really wanted the focusing effect bias. They said, this is the one that works better for me. I feel like you've seen my concerns. These are the ones that I've done, and that. So we then um, went through what are the conditions. So we did a variety of conditions. Um, again, this is all about changing medical management. So this is genetic testing influencing medical management. Um, we pivoted a bit during the study on which conditions they were. Um, our neurological uh, uh, colleague who is involved in this uh, particular study, um, I bugged him when we were writing the grant, and I said, like, what conditions do you do genetic testing for neurology? I'm like looking through the literature I can't find. I can't figure out. He wrote a paper actually explaining where you need genetic testing for neurological conditions. And so we pivoted to follow what he wrote. Um, and so uh, these are the conditions for which uh, we've developed. The Marilyn Richie's group has led the electronic phenotyping. That's been all developed. Um, and as I said, it's running, but I'm going to show data. So this is the, the conditions. Um, we did feel and para because that's near and dear to my heart. So let me talk about this a little bit. These are the logic that we used for each of these. Um, I have to say these are the numbers of patients that we have. As you can see, they uh, also um, vary a lot, particularly the cardiology patients. There are numbers of them. This is the, uh, uh, post, the uh, posterior predictive value. So this is the 
uh, part of the uh, phenotyping is 85% is considered the mean. Actually, only one of us is near 80. These is near 85%. So the, many of them close to 90, um, close over 95%, were able to identify them. We then go to see how many of them have had genetic testing. Um, in this, it varies, long QT. We're not trying to make a diagnosis here. We're just trying to identify people with the diagnosis. So I think that's really important. I have a lot of testing. Uh, VOs have a lot of testing, but some of them quite a little. Only, um, I like I was saying, Alzheimer's less than 60, only 30%, even though it affects um, uh, outcome and treatment and trials. So this is um, actually the um, uh, one of the things that we are very interested in looking at is, uh, is there a difference uh, based on race? So we went through and looked. In most cases, the um, percentage of blacks who are getting tested is less than the percentage of whites. Those are really the predominant racial groups in the Philadelphia area. Um, however, in one case, uh, more blacks are getting tested interestingly than whites, but most of them are that. And so we're trying to make sure that we affect by using the EHR that uh, genetic testing rate. So patients get a nudge. Um, they get, this is actually the non, they get both an interruptive and a non-interruptive uh, BPA. This is the nudge. And they get this come up and it says, um, you, uh, uh, this is your, your patient has been identified. It will change their medical management. Um, do you want to refer? And then there's a link to our provider website. And then here is the, uh, it's based on the registry. Uh, you go click, consult to genetics, progress note, um, and instructions, and then you sign. I'll have it there because it's too big. You sign the order and you're done. So that patient now has been referred to genetics. It's based on a registry. So everyone who's uh, got a FIO goes into registry and it gets done. This is ordering. Again, you want to open the order set. You are randomized ordering. Uh, here is your information. And here is your order set. We've already pre-populated the genes. It's default based on insurance. Your patient instructions come back. And your AVS, or your active visit summary, is pre-populated with information about genetic testing. And that is goes through. And that is the way that this study works. We're randomizing people and, starting and, um, and getting them all through this. Um, and we'll have data soon. This is um, the patient nudges that we see with the patient verification and the nudges that patients get. So this is all sort of implementation science, leveraging our EHR base to be able to do this. This has been nicely funded, um, and we're very excited uh, as the study is running. So this is a second study, very similar, uses very similar techniques. Um, this is doing improving genetic testing rates for hereditary breast and ovarian cancer. This is two diverse OBGYN clinics, um, one in Radnor, which is our suburban white, and then Dickens, which is our urban young black population. Um, these people all meet NCCN criteria, again, electronic phenotyping used to identify them. Limitations are that, of course, your uh, family history in the EHR is not always accurate. Um, but this is patients with ovarian cancer, young breast cancer, and triple negative, um, unaffected family history of ovarian cancer or male breast cancer, and two men, pen medicine appointments. So to take a look at this, this is, um, we're just starting simple here. We send them a patient portal message. Are they going to come in? Are they going to get testing? Um, if there's no response, um, is the family history accurate? That's to have they had testing and then schedule them for an appointment. Then you text, uh, send a text message, is it positive? And then the third one is to pen to consult um, uh, to be sent to clinicians. I'm going to show some data on the first two. The pending is uh, not yet um, moved forward. So this is, again, the nudges. Um, and they're doing and trialing two different nudges. So these are the nudges um, uh, looking attractive and timely, uh, uh, eligible, do not know. It's covered by insurance. You're going to pay for it. And this is, um, this is you may help with your cancer risk. This one appears on the right is probably more effective than the one on the left in terms of the nudges preliminarily. But these are the kinds of nudges that are going out to the patients, either through the portal. Um, just to show. So this is some preliminary data. I think it's actually really, really impressive. Um, so this data is um, the email. So this is just showing my pen medicine message for email. So this is showing the two different clinics. So um, they're about the same number of patients. So slightly lower numbers um, have connected uh, through the Dickens. This is just any response to the nudge. 
Um, but still, all you're doing is sending a message to the patient saying you're eligible for genetic testing. That's all you're doing and will help you get there. Then you do a text, again, uh, looking at way to health. Um, and so, uh, again, sending a text message. And so you can see that of the patients you're just sending, again, very simple interventions here, a mail, a uh, message through the portal, and then a way to health, a text. Um, you can see that of the patients that are getting through about a like this is obviously many more are coming in and getting testing. Some of them are falling out because their family history isn't accurate or they've already had testing. That's definitely happened. Um, but you can see that um, you, we've already completed of these patients who received messages. Um, you have in both cases about 100 patients have already gone in and completed um, or been scheduled. Um, and so this is something, one of the things that I think is important here that we found, although it doesn't show it as much, but is that um, we need to decrease the barrier not to make people come in, but to be able to do it virtually um, and to be able to do it and bring it uh, so that people um, do it. We have to do it slowly so it doesn't overwhelm the clinic, um, but the genetic testing appointment rates do not appear to differ between this group, showing that everyone's interested, trying to get them and getting them in is doing it, and then decreasing the barriers is part of it. So, so I'm going to talk and <coughs> a little bit about um, the Penn Medicine Center for Genomic Medicine. Um, I'm going to talk a little about mainstreaming genetic testing and then sort of some real world experience with genomic medicine or, as I say, what's happening out there. So what are the considerations um, that we think about? So steps of integration from identification, um, how do we think about sustainability? How do we think about broad phenotyping? And how do we think about e-phenotyping tools across sites? And I think it's, um, I'm going to say very strongly that um, I have gone around, um, we actually, and I'll show you some data, have really evaluated and looked at that sort of, we saw that testing happening, we actually went and did chart review, over 10,000 charts to look and see what was happening. And the reality is that specialist physicians are ordering a huge amount of genetic testing. Like, um, and how do we broaden like use of the tools that we think of beyond our traditional programs? What infrastructure do we need to provide? Um, we think about clinical decision support. Is that going to work for these? And we've seen a lot of differences in the programs that are sort of initiated by genetics professionals and non-genetics professionals and specialists. So I'm going to talk about sort of some of these tools. And at the end, I, I really wanted to leave some time for conversation because I have a sort of set of quandaries and I think things that we're really struggling with. And I'd love to hear other people's thoughts. So this paper actually is another paper that just came out. Um, this is actually mainstreaming. This is actually run by our, our genetics program, testing for pancreatic cancer. As you know, this is an NCCN guideline. Um, and so um, it used to be we sort of had this ad hoc referral process. It didn't work very well. We then did a research uh, point of care testing. So um, it, this was actually, um, I'm going to say, very laborious. It had to be identified by the research coordinator. Uh, we had a video education by the research coordinator. And then we had the GC place the order, and the study PI did it. And then specimen collection was facilitated by the research coordinator. Um, that was actually super laborious. And it actually took us a long time to try to get out of doing it. Because the problem is you set up something, you help people do it, and then they don't want to do it themselves anymore. Shockingly, they want you to do it for them. I know, a shocker. So, um, and so this is actually looking at the patients that went through. So about 900 patients went through the research point of care. Um, most patients, 83% of patients, had genetic testing at the point of care and um, agreed to it, and then 77% of patients had it. Um, and then we finally sort of worked out a process to get out. We automated the patient identification. It was verified, so that did it. Um, again, it was during initial. We had the uh, video occasion. You still need a genetic counseling assistant, um, but you have the oncologist doing it. They get permission by the uh, genetic testing. Um, the order is pended by the genetic counseling assistant, but still now signed by the oncologist and facilitated. That actually, surprisingly, was much higher. So. It turned out that when you actually got the oncologist really much more directly involved, you really increased your rate of uh, genetic testing. So 92% agree, and then 85% of patients get testing. You're really not going to get much higher than 85%. 
Um, and this is something they're really trying to mainstream and trying to learn from what we're doing to really try to um, bring this so that uh, oncologists are doing their own testing. This is set up and run by the genetics um, group that really uh, our cancer risk evaluation program. So one of the things is now we set up this great system where we have EHR integrated genetic testing. Does it work for non-geneticists? So we actually reviewed um, the testing orders. Um, so you'll see that about half of them come from our uh, Hemont Clinic, that's our cardiologist. Uh, a big chunk comes from our medical genetics, that's my, uh, my program, cardiology. Neuro, interesting, very small, we've been trying to work for them. And then there's this huge sec section of other. And so what we found was that many, many tests were being ordered outside uh, genetics programs, um, including for neurodegenerative diseases. So. I'm sorry, do you want your primary care physician ordering your test for ALS? Just asking that question. And um, I think that what we found is that um, a lot of this testing was really ineffectual. So what do I mean by, I had to coin a whole new term for this, what do I mean by ineffectual testing? What I mean is that someone places an order, they don't really, um, so one of the things about uh, the way genetic testing works for all of us who are out there is that um, the billing, it's all governed by billing. And so billing is a contract between the insurance company and the patient's, um, the patient's insurance company and the lab. They have a contract. And if we send it out to pathology in our institution, it actually breaks that contract. So all the genetics people uh, get the testing, and they send the testing out directly to that lab company so that the insurer interacts directly with the lab company. But the problem is that when people are used to doing, you know, when you go to the physician, they put in your lab orders, you go to pathology, you go to phlebotomy, and they have the lab. Um, they're not used to dealing with this totally different way of doing testing. It just is very different. And so what we were seeing, actually, all this sort of other ordering that wasn't working, that big delta between ordered and reported, were people trying to place orders that they would send to LabCorp for Invitae. Lab Corp, well, now they bought LabCorp to buy Invitae, but prior to that, um, LabCorp, like, it wasn't, wasn't working. Like, and so they were doing all of this sort of ineffectual testing. Um, I would say that the, the amount of genetic testing is, I think this 20% estimate, like, I just see it even looking at, at, at that um, in there. And I have to say, like, it's all being done by specialty physicians. Literally in the past week, endocrinology, not just at HUP, endocrinology at Lancaster, endocrinology at, I had a long discussion, we went to present our, because FIOS and PARAs are gonna be randomized, we went to talk to them, we went through this whole discussion about the study, and then they said, well, you know, we're doing all our MODI testing through in Vitae, can you tell us how to get that to work? Like, okay, like, I, I didn't occur to me that that was gonna be the primary thing they wanted to talk about. Um, and so rheumatology, I just had a discussion with uh, Doug, actually, because one of the rheumatologists came to us and wants to do all the inflammatory disease genetic testing. And then A&I, they want to do lots of testing. So specialty physicians are doing testing uh, renal. I, can't, I can go on and on. They're doing so much testing, and they're really driving a huge amount of testing. No information is provided to these patients. Like, um, and many times what you can see, and I, I was tempted to show an example of this, but I thought, no, it's probably in being some sort of privacy law, um, that you have a report. How many of you guys all have patient portals, right? So you go into that patient portal, and we can, we can pull this out. It says, I would like to have a genetic test for this. And then the provider write back, sure, I have placed the order for you to have that genetic test. And then uh, half the time it doesn't actually get done, but, uh, or properly ordered, but that's literally the amount of conversation. And I, I think that this idea that we're all gonna have genetic, like, like, you know, all genetic testing, like, I think we need to normalize genetic testing, don't get me wrong, but I think we need to provide some information to people, but like, uh, having geneticists do genetic testing, like, that's not happening. Like, the like horse has like left the other county. It's not just out of that barn. It's like in the next county. Like it just when we went in, like, and I worked there, I had no idea really what was happening. 
And it's ineffectual or it's outside the EHR. So you have all these people who don't benefit from the infrastructure we built because they don't know what's there. They're actually doing all the billing wrong. That's a whole nother, you don't want to hear about that part. Like it's actually a problem. And, um, and it's really happening. And they don't know how to do variant interpretation. Like I, I had this like, the, they're ordering these big panels. And I had a very, very smart guy, head of renal. I asked him, when you get a VUS back, do you look at ClinBar? And he asked me, what is ClinBar? You know, and so I'm like, well, how do you do your VUS interpretation? And he says, well, they don't have that disease that they have the VUS for the gene. I figure the VUS is important. Fair enough. But like, it just is like they don't, they don't know how to do it. So, so we've really focused right now. I, like, I didn't, uh, we've really focused on the large amount of genetic testing that's really happening in the, and trying to understand like, what the groups have. Like, uh, what are the groups who are trying to do testing? What are their needs? What are their special needs? Kind of help people build workflows. Really focusing on ease of ordering, logistics of sample collection. This is actually a really big barrier. Insurance, can, capitation of the cost, and results interpretation. So this we see as several steps. Um, we actually are building what we call genetic testing starter kits. Like, OK, is your preferred test available in the integration? Um, how are you getting your sample collected? Do you want the sample sent home? Um, we're actually now trying to really work with pathology so it can be done in phlebotomy and sent out centrally. Um, because right now it doesn't, um, and it sits on pathology bill, um, whole other thing. So how does that happen? We actually developed, actually as part of the advancing genome, we have a one page information set to AVS for legal, uh, approved by legal. It turns out in New Jersey for us, there's actually a law that you have to provide information for patients. Again, no one realized that. They're like, oh, we do? Like, yeah, actually, there's a law. Um, and so, you know, like, you know, we developed a one-page test, and we have smart phrases we developed for prior time. We've also developed a VUS uh, e-consult service. Not a, you don't have to come in. This is you send the VUS in. Um, or, you know, enable the consult service. So um, we're really trying to do this. I, I want to do it larger, but right now we're sort of working group by group across our hospitals. Again, we have six different hospitals to try to do this and to provide what we call starter kits for people. There are issues, though. Um, default insurance, like sending it to the right insurance company, is hard to do without registry. Uh, we've really had sort of some education around how do we optimize panels, why the 400 gene panel may not be the right panel for you. Um, and um, that's something that we've had to think about. Um, testing is really, when we do it, we do it all outside of pathology. Other physicians aren't used to that. We're trying to figure out how we're going to work with pathology to get this done. Um, and we really need to disseminate these smart phrases, the things, you know, how do we get this information out? And I think one of the things that we really um, have to think about is how do we do this? And one of the things that we've come across um, I try not, uh, is, and I'm not saying this, is that you have a VUS, someone does all this testing, they do panels, um, they get a VUS and they send it to genetics and genetics is like, I didn't order that test, it's your problem. And then you have sort of an issue where they have VUSs, they don't know how to interpret, but the genetics is like, uh, it's not my problem, and like, how do we resolve that issue? I think by having this specific VUS e-consult service where someone knows what we're doing, we're going to resolve that issue, but there has been some tension here. So I'm going to just sort of end with some of the quandaries and things that we're trying to deal with. How do we disseminate education? Like our residency, we don't even do a genetics education. And now people are doing so much testing. How, how do we tell them about you do genetic testing? How do we get this information out? How do we get it around? Um, one of the things that we're struggling with, and I, I, I have to bring up, is do we need institutional guidelines um, around, uh, like, do guidelines, is there a problem if we have guidelines? Now they're not following the guidelines. Someone could point to that. But on the other hand, no one knows there's actually a law in New Jersey about testing. So, like, how do we do that? It's very interesting. Many of these groups want to do their own panels, but they don't want to do their own exomes. So what is the role of the geneticist when they did their panel, now they want an exome? Um, I really tried to say we're physicians, we're evaluating the patient, and we'll decide if they need an exome. But that is not only sad for some patients. They want an exome. They don't realize how to do that. One of the issues that I don't think we have solved is how does cascade testing work? So you now have unaffected individuals. Your rheumatologist, who we had this whole discussion, gets people with a mutation, and they don't want to deal with the unaffected individual. They'll handle them if they have a mutation, but who's doing that cascade testing? And then one of the other issues is now all the sequencing companies actually, Epic required them. If you're integrated, we'll give you your raw sequence data back. Where do we store it? Who pays for that storage? Who governs that data? Who allows it? What happens if there's un, um, 
uh, unknown results sitting in that data. Now we have it, like lots of sort of questions and quandaries then of things that we're really thinking about. So just to say this is really high interest across really diverse provider groups in this. It's really essential to think about building a generalized infrastructure for genetic testing that can be deployed across multiple groups is our first step. Uh, we really want to decrease the barriers to test already and consultation. This is where our research study really informs how we're doing this clinically, and it's been really nice to sort of go back and forth. Um, mainstreaming has worked really well for cancer genetic testing. It really hasn't happened so much outside cancer genetics, and so something to think about. I think part of the issue is that because the NCC and guidelines are so clear for cancer, it makes it much easier to do the mainstreaming, to be honest, um, and access. Um, you know, for all groups really needs to be facilitated because if you don't have to go to a second visit, then you're doing your known provider, then we are helping access for everybody. Um, and then integration of e-phenotyping uh, to identify high risk groups, not getting appropriate testing is really our next step after we do this. Um, and just to say, I do not in any way, shape, or form do this myself. Um, the Advancing Genomic study, Medicine Study is led by myself, Marilyn Ritchie, and Robbie Schnall, who's our implementation science, so we have a big uh, expert. A Vassar Center is led by Susan Domchek and Heather Semeco, who worked on the genetic testing um, uh, in Radner and Dickens. And we have this very um, involved multidisciplinary um, group that has really worked on our um, improving our uh, information, uh, improving our EHR for genomic medicine. So I'm happy to take any questions. All right, I was told to go like this. So please, there's a microphone here if you would like to come up and ask a question. Uh, not yet. Go ahead. It seems like you're a uh, great talk. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Well, only a few things to discuss. <laughs> only a few. Yeah. Um, I feel like you're my peeps. Like you understand these are all like things I'm dealing with. Yeah. Yeah, you're dealing with them. Um, it seemed like well, you're really not, uh, making major efforts to decrease that the one barrier of entry, which is that 45-minute pre-test counseling session with a genetic counselor. I think the one pathway you yeah. had it looked like GCA only. Is that right? Yeah, for a point of care. Yeah. So we, I, I think we have several methods to do this. Um, so there is. Uh, so the way that we do this, actually, we have a video set up. Um, and so that's actually a seven-minute video that patients see. They go in. They sit in the room. They see a seven-minute video. It's a canned and video. That's a canned video uh -huh. that they see. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and so that's actually why I have to say this is, I think, the difference between um, when it's this is done sort of through someone who's a geneticist or a genetics professional and they do a video and they have people do this where, where I see, like, the endocrinologist, they're not, like... Uh, we're like the one page of information, like we're desperate for them to get that out to mm -hmm. patients. Right. Um, and so I think that um, that's sort of a difference there. But yeah, we've definitely used videos to try to sort of decrease that. Um, one of the things that um, that study is bringing people back in, but I think what we're, we were thinking about that we proposed to do was to do it actually more of the seven minute video just for patients because we really, uh, to, to decrease the barriers, particularly for patients who are underserved and getting back into the into um, things. I mean, obviously in the back end, if you're positive, that's very important and bringing people in. But I think the upfront thing you can try to sort of limit for people who meet guidelines. Great, great. And I'm super interested in that e-consult idea uh -huh. for the VUS. Is that going to be a billable service? So that's interesting question. So we, so yes, is the is the bottom line answer. So uh, just at Penn, so e-consults are available through Epic, through any, and uh, at Penn they have been not billing them, but we're actually about to bill them. Our, our big question, actually, which we're trying to resolve, is can we get genetic counsel? Like, if a genetic counselor does the VUS e-consult, can we bill? Does it have to be a physician, and how does that work? But yes, it is a billable service. So when patients get an e-consult, the physicians have to tell them they will be billed, and um, that you do it. But I think there are a lot of advantages to that, uh, as opposed to what happens right now, which is someone emails me. Um, and so it's a documented in the chart, and providers can uh, now they can either um, they can get RVUs for it. So it's a certain percentage of an RVU, so that. Uh, it counts that way. So yes, uh, it is. Um, and 
I, you know, it was one of these things where I got frustrated because I feel it is part of our responsibility to do BUS interpretation because really, but on the other hand, I understand the argument, which is I didn't order that test, it's not my problem. And so how do you balance those two mm -hmm. different things? And so having sort of a name on here is the e-consult service, and so the person who's manning it knows what they're doing, and the person who's asking the question knows what where they're asking, um, that actually seemed to be the optimal sort of balance of those two approaches. And we had someone who agreed to staff that consult. It's been a problem for clinical genetics forever, yeah. right? It's yeah. the curbstone. Everybody wants right. your advice for nothing. Exactly. And so that's mm -hmm. why, and I think that, you know, the other issue that I, I brought up that I, I am sort of challenged by is the exome issue. Like, they don't feel like, sure, they're going to send a panel, but then they want an exome. And like, first of all, we know when exomes are going to be valuable when they're not. So it's been a big tension for with us with allergy and immunology where they want exomes, but we know they're not going to find anything. And so, and they're not going to be paid for. So like that's sort of a tension there and they don't want to do it because they're worried about the secondary findings. Yeah. So I think that's something that we've been dealing with. Thank you. Okay. okay. So one from the um, Q&A. So this is from Narisu. In, in the case of, of whole exome sequencing, sorry, do you report any secondary findings back to a patient? If this decision is up to patients, what percent of patients request this report? Um, so for secondary findings, we, it's all clinical testing, so uh, it will go back. Um, we um, have not really made it sort of, I mean, you go over it, but we haven't really made it as optional. Um, I would say that most of our uh, whole exome sequencing um, is actually a lot of it's done ICU based. Um, and uh, as you were commenting, we actually have a high percentage of people who are identified sort of young ICU patients um, uh, as um, having things. Um, so we really um, give it back. I think we also, um, what's been more challenging for us is what's happening on the, remember we deal with, so we, we're next door to a, ch a children's hospital. We also work with them. And so when you have pediatric secondary findings uh, of adult onset diseases, that's um, been sort of a more challenging um, kind of thing when, when they refer those patients over to us. That's been, but we give them back, yeah. That's a great talk, thank you. Uh, myself is a pathologist, mm -hmm. so I have a lot of similar experience. Mm -hmm. First thing I want to ask is uh, for aggregating that many tests from different vendors, uh, the hard, the positive one is easy. The hard part is the negative one is true negative one on SAD or SAD not reported. That's how do you guys have actually include those? Yeah, so I would say, um, I'll say two things. So one, um, you know, I think that's a general issue for um, genetic testing in general. But I would say one of the issues that EHR specific is the mosaicism issue. And also, how do you differentiate the sort of low penetrance variant in the EHR versus the um, versus the classic variant? Um, those things, I think, the nuance there is really can be problematic to deal with. Um, the nuoseism, there is a VAF field and how that gets reported and how that's shown. We've actually that's been a big thing that we spent a lot of time sort of those things talking to Epic about and how we're presenting that data. The other thing is polygenic risk scores. <laughs> <laughs> Another thing is, uh, I think uh, I tried to uh, actually discuss in the CGC that proposed that so there's a lot of clinical trials require genetic tests, and such now we still don't have a, a standard how the template how or infrastructure how they should report a genetic test for the secondary uh, yes. analysis. Yeah, so um, there are a lot of clinical trials, and actually that for neuro, that's particularly true. So a lot of the treatment options uh, for neuro are really dependent on the genetic testing. Um, and one of the things that neuro uses, interestingly different than us, is um, they have free testing. So the, test, the companies will pay for the testing because if they're positive, they'll get their drug, just saying that. And so we actually had to build that process specifically in EHR so they could get the free testing. Um, it means that the companies get the results of the testing and like I think um, it's very interesting like I don't think the neurologists were there like whatever but some people who are more on the genetics side would be like I don't think you want to do that. So I think it, that's been something that we've had to worry about is how to how to manage that kind of thing. So it's a few minutes after okay. six. We probably should stop. But if there are other questions, um, I'm sure Kate would be willing to stick around for a little yep. bit. So thank you very much. That's this was terrific. Thank you.